Hello, my name is Frank Elsen and I'm the Electrophysiology Application Scientist at Harvard Bioscience. This video is about the patch clamp technique. It is at the level of uh, undergraduate students or maybe senior high school students. So if you are an experienced patch clamp researcher, then this video will be a little bit too basic for you. Here's an overview of what is to come in the video. Feel free to step ahead. And if you would like to learn more about um, the hard and software that HECA has for patch clamp technique, feel free to go and visit our website at HECA.com. The human brain, many facts that we could mention here. I just have those three. It is the largest brain of all vertebrates relative uh, to the body weight, and it contains 86 billion nerve cells, or what we call neurons. When you hear the number 86 billion, it is really hard to envision how large this number is. So I wanted to put it into perspective. Here is Bill Gates, and you know um, he is the founder of or co-founder of Microsoft, and it took him about 41 years to earn 86 billion dollars. Huge number. Let's put this into perspective that normal people better understand. $200. Most people have a good feeling for how much money that is. So how is $200 in relation to 86 billion? It would be like this. Let's say you would pick up $200 every second from a pile of money. And you do that for eight hours a day on every second of those eight hours. And you do that for 41 years on every day of those 41 years, then you will have approximately $86 billion. So $86 billion is a big number. And, and this, these 86 billion nerve cells, they make an even larger number of connections of what we call synapses. It's estimated uh, that there are more than 1 trillion connections in the human brain. And remember, a trillion is actually a thousand billion. So how can we put this into perspective to envision how large one trillion is? Um, I thought I'd compare it with a unit that everybody has a good feeling of what it is. And um, it's basically one second. And everybody has a good feeling how long one second lasts. And you might know that one day has 86,400 seconds and a year has 31.5 million seconds. But how far back in time would you be able to go if you could go back one trillion seconds? Is that enough time to go back and meet Albert Einstein? Or is it more time to go back and meet Mozart? Or is it even further back in time? How much time is one trillion seconds? Well, if you would be able to go back and you live in Europe, you would be able to meet these guys. To be precise, 35,000 years is approximately 1.1 trillion seconds. So the sentence is funny, but it is true. About 1 trillion seconds ago, Neanderthals still roamed on Earth. So you have a huge amount of cells, an even larger amount of, of connections, a very complex organ. We need pretty good research techniques to find out how it works. Now here in this slide, I want to really only briefly summarize some of the findings that led up to the patch clamp technique. And yes, I apologize ahead of time. Other people might have mentioned other things here. So um, sorry for that. But I think important to note here would be, for example, Luigi Galvani. He conducted experiments on frog muscles and he was the one that proposed this animal-based electricity that is somehow making those muscles twitch. Some time later, Julius Bernstein came up with a hypothesis where he said that an unequal ion distribution across the semi-permeable membrane might create a negative potential, which is then the driving force for those currents. And he put this in his, which I would call a visionary book, Electrobiologie, Membrane Theory of Bioelectric Currents. But it took another 40, 50 years until somebody actually came up with a technique, a developed a technique that would allow to test this hypothesis, which was Kenneth Cole and Howard Curtis. They uh, developed a, a voltage clamp technique. And approximately three years later, Alan Hodgkin and Andrew Huxley, they actually recorded the very first action potential, uh, which is the nerve impulse that neurons use to communicate with each other. And they, uh, for this uh, accomplishment, they actually got uh, the Nobel Prize. 
But another 25, 30 years later, there was a group around Bert Sackmann and Erwin Neer, and they developed then the patch clamp technique. And uh, Erwin Neer and uh, Bert Sackmann also received the Nobel Prize for their accomplishments. Oh, here's a picture actually from, I think it was from 2012, when they visited a, a lab and uh, yeah, they're still around. So the patch clamp technique, it all starts, of course, with this very high ohm seal between the glass membrane of the patch pipette and the cell membrane. And it's, it's, uh, this high seal is basically uh, what electrically isolates this patch of membrane from the rest of the universe, which makes it possible to record those tiny, tiny currents that flow through single ion channels. So let's envision that this is the cell with a single ion channel, and this is the tip attached to the cell in a similar way than what you see here in the middle picture. And if there's an uneven ion distribution across the membrane and the channel opens, then those ions flow along their electrochemical gradient, and they would create a signal that looks like this, for example. Now note that many ion channels have, uh, they flicker between close and open, and they would create a signal that then also looks like that, which goes between closed and open. So the patch clamp technique records the signal at the cell level and it delivers it to the computer. And before we explain how this is done, there's one more fact that is important to remember, and that would be that there's the analog signal at the cell level, and along the way it has to be translated, of course, into a digital signal uh, to go to the computer. So here is a magnified frontal part of a patch pipette, and uh, these patch pipettes, uh, they have to be created uh, by each researcher new every day. You cannot even store them uh, overnight. You have to create them every morning fresh, and you're using patch pipette pullers to do so. Another feature of a patch pipette is the very tiny tip opening. It's a very, very small, and this allows you to create a physical connection with those tiny neurons that can be as small as 10 micrometer in diameter. So you fill the patch pipette with a conducting intracellular solution, and then um, here is a drawing of such a patch pipette with uh, the uh, filled intracellular solution inside. And you have this uh, patch pipette with the solution and you put it into a pipette holder. And when you do that, of course, the silver wire, which is connected to the central pin of the uh, BNC plug, uh, the silver wire is submerged into the intracellular solution. Now you have some kind of hardware, like in this case, uh, Heker's uh, EPC-10 USB amplifier. This is a single channel recording amplifier. It has only one recording channel. We have actually up to four, a double, triple, and a quattro. So you have uh, the um, pipette holder, and you put the pipette holder on the head stage. And then the signal can travel from uh, the cell through the solution into the silver wire and into the head stage. And inside the head stage, this is what I say usually, this, this is where the, where the uh, magic of the patch clamp technique happens. Um, there, are, there is a feedback circuit, and it is much more complicated than what you see here, but for you at this moment, important to note is that it does basically two things. The first one is that it observes or measures the ionic current flow at the pipette tip, and the second, a very important part is that it almost instantaneously sends back into the tip a mirror image of the just measured ionic current that flows. And because of this fact that it sends back the mirror image, there is no net current flow across the membrane. And therefore, the membrane potential remains unchanged. And there's where the term voltage clamp comes from. So basically, it would look like this, a recording. And from here on forward towards the computer, um, the mirror image is being sent to the computer. So at the computer, at the software, the researcher sees the mirror image. This is important for uh, analyzing the data correctly, but not important to understand now how the patch clamp technique works. Anyway, so the signal is being, the analog signal is being uh, amplified by the amplifier board, which is part of the housing of the EPC-10 USB amplifier. 
and through hardwired connections, it is being sent to the interface or digitizer board. This is an important feature of Hika amplifiers, uh, which has many advantages, which I don't want to point out now. But these hardwired connections are uh, basically internal, and they send the um, uh, signal to the interface, and the interface then creates a digital copy and sends it to the computer. And this is uh, how the patch clamp technique works. Now there are different recording configurations that you can establish physically with the cell. And there are four main ones which I would like to mention here. The very first one that you have to always establish first is uh, the cell attach patch configuration, always. This is always the first one that has to be established. And then many researchers actually go a step further and open up the patch underneath the tip without losing the tight giga ohm seal to the membrane. So only the patch is being opened. And that allows, of course, then the amplifier to gain electrical access into the entire cell. So now you can clamp the membrane potential of the entire cell, the whole cell. That's why it's called whole cell patch. And then there are two more recording configurations that people use. Um, there are many more actually, but these are the two main ones that, that also are being used. And, and one would be the so-called inside out patch configuration. Again, you start off with the very first one that you see here in the picture with the cell attached patch. This is the cell attached patch configuration. But now you do not open up the patch. You leave it intact like you see in the picture. And instead, what you do is you physically move away the pipette from the cell that stretches out the membrane. It eventually ruptures and leaves you with a patch inside the tip that looks like this, where the inside of the channels is now facing the outside or the bath. Therefore, this is called inside out patch configuration. And then there's a fourth configuration. Again, cell attached first, then you establish the whole cell patch like you see here in the picture. And now you move the pipette physically away from the um, uh, cell. Eventually the membrane ruptures and the membrane of course is hydrophobic, so it closes off again. And now the outside of the channels is facing the outside of the bath. Therefore, this is called outside out patch. When you look at the bottom two drawings, you would say, ah, oh, come on, there's not really a big difference. Well, the drawings are not 100% correct. On the outside out might be because there's really um, only one or two channels, best case scenario. Um, so you might have really only one or two channels in the outside out patch. But in the whole cell patch, depending on the cell, you have tens of thousands, a hundred thousands or more channels. So the amount of ion channels in the recording is the main difference between those two recording configurations. And then the top three are, of course, single channel recordings. We already saw the signal that looks like this. So how does a whole cell recording look? Well, you can imagine that all those channels in the whole cell patch, they get activated at the same time. And therefore, all those little openings will actually add up on top of each other. Now, those channels have a feature that is, uh, they are inactivating, so they are closing over time. So the overall amplitude gets smaller. The more channels close over time, the smaller the amplitude gets. And therefore, a whole cell recording looks more like this. The main difference between those two single channel and whole cell recordings is really the, the size and the shape of the current response. So how can I now communicate with the nerve cell? How can you communicate in general? Well, you definitely need to speak the same language than the other person or thing that you would like to communicate with. So nerve cells communicate with electricity. Uh, Hello, we know electricity, so we could use electricity. So what are words or vocabulary from electricity? Well, these are parameters that we know, current, voltage, and resistance. These are, for example, three parameters that we could use. Um, yeah, but they are just single values. So we need to put them into perspective or some kind of rule or grammar that, to make sense of those. And that would be then, of course, Ohm's law. And now all we need is a physical connection with the cell. 
when you want to talk to somebody that is not in the same room than you, you have to call them or you're using your computer. So we need to have a physical connection with the other person or thing. And that is, of course, the patch clamp technique. So now we are ready to ask a question. And we could, for example, ask a question like this. Uh, what happens when we first depolarize and then hyperpolarize your membrane potential? This is the question we would like to ask the cell. Now we need, of course, software to formulate these questions and uh, hardware, of course, to establish the uh, patch clamp uh, configuration. The software that we use is a Patchmaster Next. It's from Heka. It's a patch clamp software um, and it's very modern and it's, of course, part of the computer. Inside Patchmaster Next, we have different functions. One of them is the stimulus editor. This is uh, the, uh, the functionality of Patchmaster Next that allows you to create questions. And I will not talk about here how to do that. There are more videos on YouTube that you can find that will talk about um, the functionalities of uh, Patchmaster Next and explain in more detail uh, how the stimulus editor works. In addition, please visit our website. There are tutorials and manuals there as well. So we're using the stimulus editor to create a depolarizing ramp that is followed by a hyperpolarizing ramp. On the bottom, you see the red part is the uh, depolarizing ramp where the membrane potential becomes more positive. And then on the blue part, the following blue part is the hyperpolarizing part where the membrane potential becomes more uh, negative. Okay, and then this is the question basically, which we of course in Patchmaster Next terms do not call question, we call it stimulus, stimulus uh, sequence. And um, I gave it the name RAMS, like in plural, two RAMS. Now we need the hardware, as we already saw in the patch clamp technique, we're using the EPC-10 USB amplifier for that. And then, of course, we establish um, a recording configuration. In this case, that was a wholesale recording configuration that was established with the cell. So now all we need to do really is ask the question. How do we do this? Well, in Patchmaster Next, we have something that's called control window. There you see there's a stimulus pool with lots of stimulation sequences. And here's our ramps, the question that we would like to ask. And how do we do this? Well, we press on it. And that sends the question to the cell and the cell sends back the answer basically immediately. Here's the response. And since we were in voltage clamp uh, where we control the voltage, we measure the current response from the cell. Now we need to make sense of it. We need to analyze the data. For that, in Patchmaster Next, we have the analysis editor. Um, the analysis editor, again, I will not explain here now, but basically it, uh, you can create many, many different analysis methods. And one of those I called IV uh, for current voltage reverse. Uh, this is the method um, that I used to analyze uh, this uh, data uh, response trace. And this method has uh, four functions. It can have many, many more, of course, and all functions are being executed at the same time, basically, and deliver a result. And the results of the functions, they can then be plotted in a graph. And here's the graph that we get from this analysis method. What are we looking at here? Well, the uh, y-axis is basically just the amplitude. Yeah? And in this case, it's in nanoamps. On the x-axis, we have the part of the question, basically, the voltage. And this is, of course, in millivolts. So the, the, the diagram or the curve here, the plot, shows us uh, basically the current response at the respective voltage. So when you now look at the depolarizing part, you see that there is, uh, the, which is the red trace here, which uh, you see that there is a very fast activating current at around minus 50 millivolts. Out of experience, we would usually say this is most likely a sodium ion channel or many, many sodium ion channels that create, of course, this current. Especially when you see when we further depolarize those channels, they close rapidly and the amplitude goes back 
and is getting really small. Um, uh, although you are depolarizing the membrane further, but those channels are now all already inactivated and closed. And that's why the amplitude becomes so small suddenly. And then later on at higher depolarization values at around minus 20 millivolts, there you see, oops, there's suddenly a second, a second uh, current appearing. And this out of experience, what we would usually say is uh, most likely a calcium current. And when you now look at the answer that we could give in words, basically, um, we could say something like this. Under the given conditions, which, by the way, I haven't mentioned here, so uh, the potassium channels in the cell have been blocked by an intracellular chemical so uh, from the intracellular solution, so the potassium conductance is not be able to show up here. That's important to know, of course, when you do analysis. So the answer would be like this. Under the given conditions where the potassium channels are blocked, when depolarized, I, meaning the neuron, respond with a sodium inward current followed by a long-lasting calcium current. That's the answer to our first part of the question, or at least what happens when we depolarize your membrane potential. That's the answer. Now, when you look at the hyperpolarizing part of the question, you see that there is still the calcium currents active. And it inactivates later when you come back to more negative potentials. That's when the channels start to close again. So basically, because we know this also from experience, um, the answer to our second part would be uh, what happens with the following hyperpolarization. Well, during the following hyperpolarization, I still exhibit the long-lasting calcium current. So here we have it. Question asked, questions answered. Last slide, I want to quickly just point out a couple of um, uh, applications uh, that are usually being used with the patch clamp technique. Of course, it is important to note here that um, to uh, really use the patch clamp technique, you need to use excitable cells and you're using usually small excitable cells. And then there is, of course, neurons. Neurons are really the main uh, cell type that is being investigated with patch clamp, with the patch clamp technique. But there are, of course, also muscle cells, cardiac, as well as smooth muscle cells um, that can be investigated with uh, the patch clamp technique. And then don't forget that some cells, oh, sorry, some plants also have excitable cells. So it's not that common, but people are also investigating those. Now, in terms of um, how to prepare the cells, or what kind of applications you're using it, uh, many times people actually have cell culture. And then there is, of course, the possibility that you have acute slices from animals, uh, very often uh, mice or rats, but also other animals where you can make acute slices from and then record directly from those cells. There are advantages and disadvantages, which I don't want to point out now, but um, this is being done a lot. And then there are, of course, people where they record from in vivo, basically from the whole animal and do patch clamp recordings from the brain uh, of a whole animal. And then finally, uh, of course, the patch clamp technique is really, really um, uh, very powerful in, in terms of being combined with other techniques. For example, fluorescence um, is very often being used or other techniques that allow you to further um, uh, yeah, use the patch clamp technique in other ways that makes it very, very powerful. So finally, I would like to introduce you to our team, uh, Martin Oberhofer and Barbara Vardas. Um, they are uh, for, electro, uh, yeah, for electrophysiology as well as myself. Uh, and they are both um, in Germany. I'm located in Chicago. And then we have um, Frank Wong, who is an electrochemistry specialist. He is located actually in Seattle. So together we are at this moment the HECA support team. So uh, please feel free to send uh, HECA specific or general patch clamp as well as um, ECAM questions to support at HECA.com and we will be happy to answer those. 
Um, if you want to learn more about HECA, yeah, you go to the website. I already mentioned that. There are manuals, tutorials, and other helpful information right there. Um, for sales-related inquiries, I would suggest um, to go to the website uh, and go to the sales tab. And there you find information on what email address to use because it depends on the location where you are in the world. So go to that um, website, go to sales and check out what kind of email you should use if you have sales related inquiries. Okay, that's concluding the whole video now. And um, yeah, we wish you exciting and successful experiments. Have a nice day. Bye bye.